Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Jan Johnson is going to talk about her new book, Heaven is a Garden. We're going to talk about landscape design, but also many different elements that can help make your garden into your own private piece of heaven. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Jan Johnson. Good afternoon, Jan, and welcome to the show. Thanks, June. I'm thrilled to be here. Jan, I really love all the different things that you wrote about in this book, especially since I'm a master gardener, and I know that you were inspired by one of my most favorite places on the planet, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. So can you share with our listeners a little bit about yourself and also some of the places that have inspired you throughout your life? Oh, that, that's what a great question to start with. You know, so I am a professional um, landscape designer, and I've been doing this for over 40 years. But I did grow up in Brooklyn in small apartments, and um, my father would take me to the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, and that basically changed my life when I saw that. It's yeah. evident by all the detail that you put in this book. I see so many books that I skim through, and they kind of gloss over different techniques. But you really get into detail, and that's what I really appreciate about your book. I thought it was beautifully written. There's a lot of really great ideas. The components that you focus on are also refreshing. And I don't want to give away the whole book, but you know, I, I hope that we could talk about some of these elements because I think – Regardless of the size of your property, you can do so much with it. And that's what I really appreciated about Heaven as a Garden. I tried to share ideas. I have a very tiny backyard. And I tried to share ideas and techniques that anyone could use on any size property. Jan, where do you actually begin? How do you figure out what design works best, especially for the space that you're working with? What I do, the first thing I do, and I write about this in the book, I start off with a chapter called The Power of Place, because obviously, you know, that's where we all start from, you know, in our in our backyard or wherever we're working. And the first thing I do, whether it's a big property or a little property, is I look for what I call the power spot, and I write about that. Yeah, the power spot is really a key focal point in any garden. For people that don't quite understand how the landscape is designed, so on and so forth, can you offer some advice as far as how you can figure out what your power spot is? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Because I do this for a living, so I go to somebody's property, and I say, okay, let's go find the power spot. And, of course, everybody's very intrigued by that concept. And, you know, they think that perhaps it has to be this big, overlook, you know, 10 feet high or something. And I say, no, no, no. A power spot is any place that just feels a tiny bit different than the other parts of your yard. Like, for example, with mine, it's a very tiny yard. It's the uh, far back corner. And when you stand there, you just get a, a beautiful view of the yard, and it just feels comfortable. So I say, look for a space that's either slightly elevated. It could just be like maybe a foot higher than the rest of the land around it, or or even more, of course. Or it could be what I call the shaded corner, which is like the heart of the garden. And I say those are places that are a little bit different than any place around it. 
Jan, you also write about something that you call the four directions. Oh, Can you yeah. explain to our listeners what they are and also how they work with other components of the garden? One of the things that um, I, I've been doing for my during my whole career is I've been looking at the ancient traditions and seeing how they worked with the land and with siting buildings or gardens or roadways, whatever, how to work with the land. Because I, the same things that that our ancestors uh, enjoyed and that appealed to them appealed to us. And I, I felt that we'd lost that in, in recent decades. So one of the things that came through when I looked at all the different traditions from all around the world, whether it was Celtic or Hawaiian or Japanese or South American or Native American, was this um, understanding of the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. And interestingly enough, they all ascribe the same qualities to each of the four directions. And again, in my book, I talk about this. But I would like to share one with you, if, if I can, one direction and talk about it some. And that is the um, direction of east, because east is considered by all the all the various traditions as the most auspicious direction. Isn't that interesting? Why is that? Well, uh, and I'll give you a few examples and explain why. So, for example... In the Gothic cathedrals, the co- congregation faces east, like, say, St. Patrick's Cathedral or St. John the Divine Cathedral. I'm, I'm referring to New York ones, but, you know, if you go to Europe, the same thing holds true. And um, if you think of the great old libraries of the world, and again, I'll say, like, the 42nd Street Library, all the windows are facing east. And if you look at Native American teepees, they all had the openings to the teepees, face east when they set them up and even vastu which i know you know this is the um similar to feng shui from india vastu say all gates and doors of a building in a town should face east and so you say well why is this what's so special about east and people say well that's easy that's where the sun rises that's why everybody Mm. likes east but there's more to it than that and and it it revolves around two things number one the plants definitely grow better when they face east when they get east sunlight because they go to sleep at night they wake up in the morning and then they that blast of gentle dawn light hits them and they immediately start to grow plants do their most growth in the morning so if they get the eastern light they're thrilled. You know, they're very, very happy plants. So that's a wise gardener's secret. Make sure you have your vegetable garden facing east. And then also, the other thing about east is that they found that when we face east, our the synapses in our brain fire more rapidly and we actually think better when we face east. And I think that explains why. That is fascinating. I've never heard of that before, and I really appreciate that. In horticulture, you always learn something new, regardless of who you're working with, whether you're volunteering or where you're at, and you just taught me so much, and I'm I'm so so grateful. Thank you. Yes, I I go into it in a little bit more detail in the book, and I do also address north, south, west, because they all have their own innate qualities. And and isn't this interesting? We can apply that knowledge to anything, you know. So. Um, oh, exactly. Yeah, and that's kind uh, of and that that also is in the chapter called Power of Place, where um, I talk about uh, the earth and the directions and all sorts of things like that. Thank you, Jan. What is pooling and channeling? <laughs> oh, isn't that a great term? Pooling and channeling is a design technique, and it's been used forever. Um, I, one of the be- pooling and channeling, in, as a matter of fact, it's a way to move people through a space. Again, it could be a little tiny area, it could be a big area, and it's. Uh, to, if you say, for example, if you're going to design a walk, if you make the walk narrow and straight, 
people will move through it quite quickly. And no one knows that better than Disney World. When Disney World wants to move you from point A to point B, it'll make it a narrow, straight walk. And if you want to get them to move even faster, you put plants on both sides of them that are fairly high. It's very similar to the way water moves through the landscape. That's how people move through the landscape. Water goes quickly through a straight channel, but then the minute water hits a wide pool, what does it do? It kind of slows and starts to swirl around. Same thing with people. The minute people hit an opening, like a pool, so to speak, they, they slow up and they kind of stop. And so, again, Disney World does that, too. They, bring, they direct you to a big open area and everybody kind of sits around. So that is the technique I talk about called pooling and channeling, how to move people through the landscape without them even knowing that you're controlling their movement. Isn't, I love that. I think that's so fascinating. I think that's absolutely <laughs> right? clever. Right, I know. That's, that's so just brilliant. And, and, you know, if you go to, um, for people who are into garden design, if they go to the Moorish gardens down in the, the south of Spain, you'll see that the, the Moorish gardens is pooling and cha- channeling brilliantly, just fantastically. And and also the French and everything, but I just I always marveled at it in the Moorish Gardens. Thank you. You spent a lot of time talking about the role of shapes. Why do you feel that they're so important in landscape design? Well, I find that again, looking at ancient traditions, shapes were the one of the first things that you see when you enter a space. So, for example, we are all very drawn to the circle, the the circular shape in the landscape. And um, in my book, I have a chapter called Creating Music for the Eye, Line and Shape, because shape actually can be seen almost as a musical form. I call the circle the whole note in the landscape. Just, you know, it's, um, it's a compelling outdoor feature, and it fosters unity within its perimeter. We all, when we enter a circular shape on the ground, um, we always kind of look to the middle. You know, that's why they'll have a circular driveway, let's say, with something right there smack in the middle, because it almost forces you to do that. But circular shapes were used by the Native Americans in their council rings, and they would have these grand meetings where they'd all sit around in a circle. And when Benjamin Franklin went to visit them, I think this is up in the northern like near Maine or somewhere, he was so um, intrigued by this circular shape that when they came back, he he recommended it for the uh, Capitol building. And that's why the Capitol has a circular shape. And it does foster unity. So um, that's just one example, council rings, outdoor shapes. And I, in my book, I show photos of round patios that I've created that you know, are intended to create that sense of community and togetherness. You also mentioned spirals. How can you incorporate a spiral element into your landscape? I I thought that was fascinating. Spirals, as you know, June, are are the shape of growth. That's the natural shape that nature takes when it's growing. Whether the trees are growing upright, they spiral around, or, or, you know, you see the spiral twining of of vines or the spiraling of the pine cones. I mean, spiral is the shape of growth and evolution. And nowadays, people are very intrigued by the the spiral. It's kind of hard to incorporate it into a usable functional landscape because it's just how you sit within a spiral. However, as a walkway, you you know, the, the labyrinth and the spiral path is the way to go. And I think people are very compelled almost to walk along the spiral walkway. So that's the, probably the best way to incorporate a spiral in a garden is, is in a self-contained walkway. Thank you. You also talk about trees. Trees are key for many reasons. They create habitat, they reduce noise, they provide privacy and beauty. What are some of your favorite trees? Oh, you know, this is when I kind of go go a little bit woo-woo because I truly do believe that trees speak to us. You know, if you put your hand on a, tr- on a tree trunk, like on an oak tree, 
I swear you can feel the strength and the endurance and the stability that the oak emits. All of the cultures of the world say that oak is the uh, tree of uh, courage and endurance. And then if you go over to, say, a white pine tree and you put your hand on the, on the trunk or you just sit within its boughs, you feel a total different atmosphere. And, and that makes sense, too, because the white pine is known as the, uh, the peaceful tree. And, and so if you, um, and there's a lot of stories that I share in my book about that. So if you want to create an atmosphere of peace in your backyard, then I think white pines would be the, the way to go. I love white pines. They're a native tree. And if you need something strength to, and, and indomitable spirit, then an oak tree is, is the tree for you. There's no accident, June, that they planted 242 oak trees in the, um, in the World Trade Memorial Park. After Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Katrina, unfortunately, a lot of people cut down trees because they were concerned about damage to their property and they just didn't want to deal with the aftermath after a storm. They didn't realize that this was creating a lot of problems for the environment because of loss of habitat and also trees help to reduce energy. So hopefully more people will incorporate different trees into their landscape. Jan, can you offer our listeners a little bit of advice as far as what they should be thinking of when figuring out what they want to do with their landscape for planning the next season? Because I know landscape is not something that when you're designing, it's not something that happens overnight. There's, There's so much work that's involved. So what should people be doing at this point in time? Yeah, that's a wonderful question because a lot of times people get caught up with the spring fever, you know, in April, May in our part of the world and run out and buy this plant, that plant and kind of willy-nilly put them around and then and then they wonder why their their garden doesn't feel cohesive or doesn't have a doesn't seem so inviting because it's kind of more of a hodgepodge. So what I always suggest is that look at your yard as a series of areas, whether it's the entry zone or the sitting zone or the or the little open play area, whatever it is, and really think about creating spaces in that. I talk about the power of the portal, how you enter into your space, and then the lure of the sheltered corner where you can create a sheltered corner where people love to sit. And so in my book, I kind of I really do strive to say to people, look, let's let's look at this in in different parts rather than just think of it as a place where you just throw some plants in. And so I I hope that uh, they do that. Look at it as an outdoor space rather than a place just to plop some plants. I hope that made some sense there. <laughs> sure. Jan, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show today. Your book, Heaven is a Garden, is Filled with so many amazing tips, I learned so much from it, and I really appreciate you taking the time today to be on the show. Oh, I love being on your show, June, and anytime you want me back, I would be thrilled. Uh, you're very welcome, and I definitely will have you come back, and I look forward to meeting you at some point, especially with all the different lectures that you're conducting. So I hope you have the time to come back. <laughs> yes, certainly. And folks, please check out Heaven is a Garden by Jan Johnson. It is really a lovely book that's filled with so many innovative ideas, and you can tell that she really knows her stuff. And she's not afraid to share the information, which is something that I really admire. So many people are hesitant when it comes to giving out information about horticulture and It's a shame because horticulture is something that you can never be truly a master of. There's always so much to learn. And this particular book really has taught me quite a lot. And it was just really refreshing to see something that was so inspiring. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.